the cloud recording yes okay hi Anna so I think it is March 29th today 2020 um, where are we <laughs> <laughs> is it really March 29th I'm not sure I, I think it is I think it's Sunday March 29th oh damn it I just touched my face um, <laughs> So here at the hospital, nobody's allowed to visit their family members in, 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 the, in the wards, on the wards, any ward, really. No okay. visitors allowed. There's big signs outside. Um, you told me yesterday that you understand kind of like why that is, that it's for, you know, it's for reducing risk of people bringing COVID-19 from the hospital back out to the community. But what a challenge for family members to, to know that their other family members are inside the hospital alone generally, you know, and we would hope that all the physicians and nurses are, you know, spending their time with the patients, you know, comforting the patients who are alone in their exam rooms. Um, especially those who are COVID-19 pending or COVID-19 positive. But who knows in actuality how much time we're able to spend with each patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, there's layers of questions here, right? And that would be one of them is, you know, in, in Guelph, or in your hospital, what's, what's the pace like right now? Is there less time? Than, I mean, I would assume there's less time than usual, but how much less time? Well, there's definitely a lot more meetings, a lot more communication happening, and those meetings take time away from clinical work, but they're really necessary in this time because this is, these are unprecedented times where new workflows, uh, new adaptations to infection control processes, new ways of communication and keeping up to date on, on changing guides from infection control and, and public health. So, yeah, it it's balanced itself out in terms of how many workers we have. Our, our patient to staff ratios are probably not very different. Um, there mm -hmm. are a lot of staff members who have identified themselves as being at high risk for uh, something really infectious like COVID-19. And, and of course, those of us who are healthier, we don't want our colleagues at, at risk either. And so some of them have uh, taken that unenviable position of having to sit at home and know that the rest of us are, are at the hospital and and I've heard that there's quite a bit of distress about that too that sitting out for their sake is causing them stress too but but that does leave us with a reduced workforce as well on the healthcare provider side and as we prepare for a surge that is that's kind of scary for all of us um, yeah but so uh, how much, yeah, the, the volumes, it's kind of equaled itself out. The volumes to the emergency room are much lower than average. I think that's okay. because people know that you could encounter COVID-19 on the way to the hospital or at the hospital. So if I can really just stay at home, people are staying at home. I, I think people are in British Columbia. Yeah, and I hope not just, I hope it's not just about the fear of, um, encountering it, but also sort of rethinking about, well, what's going on with me and does this really require a visit to emergency, right? That, that long-term discussion that we have in Canadian healthcare yeah. in terms of why people and when people use emergency, right? So, yeah, the, yeah. The choosing, choosing wisely of our resources kind of thing. And it, it brings to mind a whole bunch of tangential questions right now about, you know, how will this reset our threshold for going to the emergency room going forward or are we going to revert back to pre-pandemic times who knows probably depends on how long this goes on for right yeah how much becomes a habitual thought pattern right what do they say two conscious. weeks <laughs> yeah, yeah. We past that yeah it, that that will be a fascinating question to observe afterwards whatever afterwards actually means somebody used that term that word yesterday on Twitter after, and I said, well, how are we defining after? When's the after? Like, when, when will we know we're after? <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure that will actually exist. Like, it, or is it just, you know, um, 
do we, we, will we have just completely changed, you know? Mm -hmm. Did, do you think it's important that we introduce ourselves on this recording? I don't know. I'm oh. guessing you're going to share it on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What sure. Are you going to throw an intro? Um, let's, let's go for it. Um, let me start off. Um, yeah. we've, so we've done this before, Lawrence, a couple of times. We've done this in a group with a couple of other people, with um, another patient advocate and another doctor. And we've also done this, just the two of us, with your inaugural um, FTS in the Fonda um, podcast. So um, my name is Yana Bielman, and uh, I'm many things, but for the purposes of this recording, I'm a patient advocate patient and caregiver advocate. And I think the caregiver word um, almost comes out um, more to the forefront in terms of some of the things that we could talk about today. Um, so that's who I am. And I'm a family doctor, uh, Lawrence Yang in Surrey here. And yeah, I'm really interested about getting conversations going that, that matter, finding out what matters to um, healthcare professionals and patients and public and you know, getting those really necessary, crucial conversations going. And in the, these really different times, in, in, the, in pandemic times, um, the, the role of patients and the role of healthcare professionals and the role of care providers and family members, uh, they're shifting. There's a lot of shifting and kind of finding our footing and rediscovering our identities and our purpose and, in, in these times. And so, I'm excited to connect with you today and explore a little bit of that. One of the things I was thinking about before this conversation that I think is important to acknowledge is that this is an N of one. We haven't, I haven't used that term or that hashtag for a while, but this is a conversation between a, a patient and a physician. And in that regard, one of the predominant thoughts in my mind today is how in a situation like this, we as individuals, but then also as communities and as systems, we regress when we are triggered or when we're anticipating something or, and maybe I should, or do we regress? I'm asking that as a question. So I'm curious what you see in yourself and then maybe what you, what you can say about the system around you of healthcare. And I can comment on that too. But what I'm saying is what I see in myself is a regression in my learned coping mechanisms. And obviously it's very fight or flight based, right? Um, and that there, there's a danger. You know, at my core, I'm observing what that danger is. Am I safe and what actions I need to take? And what I've observed over the last few weeks is that some of the skills and coping mechanisms that I've developed over time and even, you know, some newer ones just in the last year, they've disappeared. I, I realize I've shed them. Where are they? I notice them because um, in some of the behaviors or thoughts or feelings I'm having, I'm realizing, oh, well, I'm, I'm not dealing very well with this. So I spent, I've spent a fair bit of time kind of checking in on that and listening. And it makes me wonder about things like N of one and patient family centered care. Um, and also the quote unquote humanizing of healthcare professionals and that we've been asking you now, as particularly as advocates, we've been asking you and also giving you space to be human beings and to express yourself as human beings and reminding you, right? And the system's been doing that too. So I wonder in a time like this with this kind of a trigger, a pandemic, um, well, how you're feeling as an individual, as a physician in that regard, but then also, is the system doing the same thing? Is the system kind of regressing? And is that maybe why as advocates, we're looking around and going, whoa, where, where's the space for us? And, and, and you know, um, I'm not a visitor, I'm a caregiver. So what does that mean in terms of no visitors in hospitals? Um, anyway, there's a couple of questions there. Take it where you will. Yeah, no, I'd like to explore what you just said further before I give you my perspective. You said, I'm a caregiver, not a visitor. So it, it, what, what that sounds to me is that you, you feel that there's a role for you to play as a caregiver to any patient who might be in the hospital right now. And you, you could be auxiliary or, or ancillary to, to what the health professionals are delivering right now to the patient. Um, meaning if let's say the patient has COVID-19 you could learn the donning and doffing of, of, uh, of uh, you know, the personal protection equipment and, and, and provide help, I guess, if, if it really came down to that. 
is that what you're kind of saying or well i'll um i'll shift it over slightly and i'm not speaking for me personally but i'm thinking of of other advocates um that i'm hearing from who are talk and and um medical moms who are talking about children who um need their care daily and so of course there's a lot of fear in terms of um the disconnect of of messages which are no visitors and thinking about god forbid if their children would become infected what would happen because their children don't function without um without their care right and we can apply this in other contexts too it's not just children if i think about uh, um, my husband who for the purposes of this call i'll qualify um died about three years ago of cancer if he was in active cancer treatment and needed my care and then um, was diagnosed with covid um it, how it, you know, there's layers to that in terms of the role and responsibility that I feel as a caregiver, but also knowing what the person I care for really truly needs, and all of the things that we've talked about in the context of advocacy, that the knowledge that we have as caregivers about the person we're caring for, and without COVID, if we would come into the hospital, we would integrate into the dialogue, hopefully with healthcare professionals, right? Um, in rounds and otherwise, we provide information about the care we've been giving at home our knowledge of our child or loved one's um, context in terms of disease. And so when you drop COVID on that, and then you drop no visitors, and the word caregiver isn't in there, and, and it, in many people's minds, there's that notion of, well, I'm not a visitor. I play a very particular role for my loved one. Um, those are huge questions. And then the conflict of uh, that is also, you know, speaking more broadly, because obviously I, I don't at present speak for that context. Okay, but if I if I put my foot down on this and I feel I have to because of my responsibility to my loved one, now what does that mean in that maybe there isn't a mask for me? And if I don a mask, I'm taking a mask away from a healthcare professional. Um, these are are um, powerful, powerful internal debates, right? I think yeah. I, so from the healthcare provider perspective, I believe there is great great concern about about our own our own survival, you know, within this situation. As you said, I think there's a regression to base instincts of survival at some level. And we try to intellectualize them and we try to create other reasons why, you know, patients ought not to be, or patients' family members not ought to visit at this time. We actually have, some of us have challenges trusting even our own colleagues with their ability to, to maintain maintain ster sterility we oh, actually yeah. we actually pair up and we general we're pairing up and we're watching each other put on personal protection equipment because you can make a mistake and we're sure. making mistakes on the regular and so we, we watch each other put them on we're, we have double checks now and because we've been doing it for potentially years and we're still you know at at risk we have very little trust that those who don't do this on a regular basis can maintain sterility um, with the stringency that we're struggling to maintain ourselves. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I have to say that most of the, we haven't, we haven't identified any cases where it's a healthcare transmission within our hospital, but, you know, we're struggling and we're nervous in this unprecedented um, infectivity, like uh, the, the virulence of this particular strain is, is, is very new to us. And because we're grasping at straws, trying to adapt to this invisible war, really, and invo invisible army, that it's hard to add complexity to that. And yeah. so we're trying to simplify things as much as possible. And, and our concern, you know, even though we are concerned about patient experiences, it, it falls to the wayside when we're thinking about survival. You know, we're thinking about For sure. what, is how, how big is our healthcare workforce now? We're already cut down slightly. And if a surge is coming and some of, and some of us are getting sick, you know, uh, and we're going to lose some of us, we have to really do everything we can to reduce the variables. We have to tighten up the defenses. Like that's really the, it's a, it's a crisis management emergency response time right now. And I think the, in those times, some of those, some of those feelings uh, or 
other people's worries, it's hard to entertain all of that at the same time as we're trying to adapt to that situation. So yeah, sure. that's what you meant about the regression. Regression is sure. a little bit more draconian measures as people have been talking about. Well, yeah, you know, and, and I think about, I'm not a, a mother who's really a mama bear. I can think of about two times in my daughter's 14 years in which that has come to the surface. And now when we leave, we live in an, an apartment building. When we leave, um, I give her instructions such that like, yeah, my mama bear kicks in as soon as we open that door handle and she doesn't kick out again until we back, get back home. And I think my daughter's quite surprised. So then if I think about, if I think about even just listening to what you have just described and if my daughter needed my care on a daily basis, um, in a particular, you know, physical or, or, or other ways, I can't imagine how my mama bear would be ignited in terms of protecting my child from either contracting um, COVID or thinking about a scenario in which they would go into hospital. Now, my understanding is children's is allowing, quote unquote, allowing, I, some people get their back up at that word, but I'll, I'll use the word, they're allowing parents in with children. Are you, do you know anything about that? No, no I've, yeah. been, I've been pretty pretty involved out here in Surrey. So yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. So I, I wonder in that context in a children's hospital where that is more predominant in terms of the parent's role as caregiver, as well as parent, if, if Mary, maybe they're looking at different pro approaches to that. So, mm -hmm. so what about procedurally in terms of systems? Do you see, you know, if you sort of comment on that more generally in terms of, does it feel like as a whole, like as teams that, that practices are kind of regressing or contracting or, um, especially like we talk about if you're having to go to meetings a lot more and there's a lot more discussion, um, I would think there'd probably be less space for, I don't know, some of the regular conversations or, or an openness or a layering of complexity. Mm -hmm. There's definitely complexity. There's definitely a uh, changing, the goalposts are moving uh, in terms of what our ideal approach to infection control is day, to, day by day. For example, the increased usage of max, masks around the hospital, for example. So, and, and what type of PPE, PPE is acceptable for family physicians to use in the clinic, those types of things are changing. Who to screen, you know, that's been changing uh, week by week. Uh, but I, I've noticed, uh, actually an increase in integration and collaboration. We have different bodies, the, the bodies that I'm uh, involved in at least, we have in the hospital, we have um, leadership committees and everybody's joined up on different chat groups to try to spread information quickly. We're using platforms like WhatsApp and Slack to ensure that we're staying up to date on what each other's struggles are and providing each other advice. So that has been collegial and and con the connectedness has been like never before in, in, in that aspect. In the community we have, uh, as a family physician, we have the divisions of family practice who have done an aggressive um, campaign to join physicians to different WhatsApp groups, depending on their neighborhood. And then they have staff members that straddle each of those neighborhoods and, and push out information from public health and from the doctors of British Columbia for example, and the Ministry of Health to make sure that everybody's really up to date and feeling connected. So that's been actually a great thing in my, in my uh, assessment. The volume of work for, for physicians outside of the hospital, for most of them, it's dropped significantly. But for each patient, they're having to use uh, PPEs in the, sometimes in the, in, the, in the clinic, so it slows them down. But they've also been transitioning, like, at least 30 to 40 percent of physicians who never used telehealth before family physicians are now using telehealth uh, options so they're staying busy um, but probably less volume of work than than prior because people are just not leaving their homes and they've yeah. some of them may be slow to access the telehealth and some of them are glued to the television and internet like the rest of us are to try to figure out how things are going in some of their usual health concerns are are fading a little bit into the background they're not coming to the family doctor's office so i i don't know if that what did, i don't really know what you meant about expanding and contracting but 
Yeah. People are more connected. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, that's really positive to hear. I was just thinking in that sort of like, can you, can you leap from that personal context in which, which we might, you know, regress a little bit in our coping me mechanisms? I'm wondering if systems are doing the same and, um, and, and, and where I think we might see that is in what advocates are talking about, patient and caregiver advocates in terms of not knowing what, where the space is for them or being extremely concerned that there's no space for them in terms of what um, levels of engagement or dialogue would, would normally exist. And one of the things I wondered about was, you know, it, I guess it's a bit like a habit, right? It's what we were talking about earlier. Have we been integrated into process lo processes long enough that we're just considered an integrated part of things? Um, the other, and well, I think one really good example that's different is medical assistance in dying. There are two places now in Ontario that have ceased the provision of MAID, regular MAID. Um, I mean, I have some questions in my mind about how MAID might be used in the context of COVID to relieve someone suffering um, if they ask for it. And I'm, I'm curious if, if people are asking for it. Um, we may not be there yet in terms of how the pandemic has hit, but I see that. I see a line between what are the implications of COVID for regular MAID, if you can coin a phrase like that. And then is there a, a context for made within COVID itself? But, um, you know, to compare it to what I'm asking about um, patient and family centered care and some of the related advocacy has made been with us long enough that we just assume that it is a natural part of the system. I know that Canadian Association of Made Assessors and Providers is, has, from what I've read, been really pushing its members to within their own systems advocate for made being an essential service. Um, an essential part of practice. And it sounds like that's happening in some places, but I know in, I believe it's Hamilton and Ottawa, they've ceased the provision of, of regularly scheduled MAID. So, you know, is it the same, and will, will that bounce back? Is that one of those sort of system shrinkage, system, you know, expansion once we realize that, no, this, this can exist in, this, in the pandemic context? And so is that the same for patient advocacy? And, and where, are, where are the spots within for us in terms of, those dialogue. And so as, as you can imagine too, because um, advocates who do this kind of work are normally integrated into activities with healthcare providers, we see all of you ramping up, right? And we have that same sort of like call to battle, if you will, if I could put it that way, we've got that same feeling. And I know I'll speak for myself. I don't have a lot of active work on my plate, regular work as an advocate as a in the volunteer context, but I know I'm on the edge of my seat. I'm like, okay, let's go. I'm ready to go. What do you want me to do? And, and looking at, you know, my conversations with you and other friends who are pro providers um, watching you and sort of feeling helpless, right? Like, what is it that, that I can do um, in terms of my skills and abilities? And so looking around for things like that. So, yeah, there's lots of layers here for sure. I'll give you some space to share your thoughts on that, but I do have another question. Yeah, no, I've, I've, the the desire to help and the you know the the expressions of love and support from all of you who who aren't able to be here on the front lines are is so so lovely and it, it really fuels all of us you know we've gotten donations of of and offers for food and discounted clothing discounted gas discounted drinks you know I, we really were feeling so much support in those 7 p.m. celebrations. I witnessed mm -hmm. one for the first time uh, mm -hmm. live yesterday, and it was beautiful. And uh, yeah. but but all we we feel it, and I I've sensed a lot of people. People are messaging me from all over, like, "What can we do? What can we do? What can we do?" And the best thing you can do is stay healthy and love your loved ones for us. You know, yeah. hug your kids and and enjoy life, you know, that's, enjoy life, you know, and, and be present with your family. That's like really all you can do because that's what most, most of us are missing now, missing the ability to be present with our, our family and our kids because we're nervous that we're bringing them, bringing home a little bit of death for them, you know, so. Yeah. From, from what you said about MAID, I think, you know, medical assistance in dying really requires awareness on both sides, awareness from the patient that they're probably close to, to dying and also awareness from the physicians that they're probably close from dying. And we're dealing with a new disease, a new diagnosis that we act as, as health professionals, we don't know if you're going to die at all. We don't know if you're yeah. going to be intubated tomorrow. We don't know if you're going to recover tomorrow. So the awareness on the physician side is not that yet there to allow for, for medical assistance in dying for COVID patients. 
uh, COVID positive, 19 positive patients, but for other dis uh, diseases which are, have a more predictable and understandable trajectory, I think medical assistance in dying, you know, ideally, since it's lawful, ought to be uh, provided for patients who choose it. But yeah, it's, it's that's a tricky thing. And patients don't know. And often patients who potentially would benefit from MAID, their respiratory system is so taxed that they're so fatigued when they get to us sometimes that they have no opportunity to express their desires in a coherent mm -hmm. manner. So, and that's really unfortunate. Yeah. Well, and, and I know when I, when I expressed this, asked this question on Twitter, one, uh, one doctor responded and said, well, most patients are going to be in the ICU. So that made just not an option there. Um, so, okay. I understand that context, but I do think for, for those of us who speak from an advocacy point of view regarding made, and certainly, you know, given some of the amendments or revisions that we're looking at with the process, I think, after, quote unquote, it's going to give us space to ask a lot of questions because of course it's so procedural, right? It's so process based and so it should be. But it, you know, that was my question that, you know, could you apply made in a COVID context, say if if you were even able to, right? Like there's could you in terms of a, a health context, but then even just procedurally, there's so many steps involved. So, you know, but I think to, get, to go back to the patient advocacy context, I think for us, what's different is that, well, much like, you know, a healthcare provider, when you go home, you know, we're human beings and we're all taking those sort of basic human steps to keep ourselves and each other safe. But for us, the seven o'clock, seven o'clock bell and the, you know, uh, bringing you guys sandwiches and stuff, that's just not enough because we've been in there contributing to systems change and and not just change but just system processes you know we've been we've been integrated in participating in those so and some of that work is still going to go on right because it's outside of of um, you know direct interaction with this with COVID but um, some of the interesting things I've heard people mention are things like communications where there's a role for advocates to participate in how information about COVID is communicated so that you know that it, that impacts how it's perceived by the public so i think that's you know a pretty pretty practical application um yeah yeah i one one of the things i've been impressed with and they did this in in korea which is a lot more i guess it has a little bit more of a where the government has a little bit more control and maybe society is a little less liberal and a little a little bit less pluralistic that um, that the that the, they've used app based screening and app based monitoring of of the public and by the government thereby allowing public health to have to keep tabs on the public and also allowing the public to receive information based on their current symptomology and in British Columbia I was pretty impressed that we created well, there, there was the development of that Thrive app and I think you and and Claire actually uh, contributed to that. And that's a communication tool and an as a self-assessment and health information provision tool. Can you tell us a little bit about your involvement there? Sure, so that was with um, communications with the Ministry of Health and there are 20 odd of us who um, put our names forward through the Patient Voices Network. Um, we're all trained volunteers in that regard. And so we met on very, we were chosen on very, put our names forward, chosen on very short notice and met the next day and had a very short turnaround in terms of end of day to give comments to the, to, to give the app a bit of a beta test. And it's pretty powerful. I know the things that jumped out at me. Um, and then to see all of our comments combined afterwards, there was some amazing feedback that contributed to that app. And then was it Monday that it rolled out? So we had our comments in by end of day on Friday and um, by Monday the app was live. So, and we, we were sticking together as a team to be able to provide further commentary to in other contexts as well. So yeah, that's one place where, where you know, I think those of us who feel really strongly about this are in a position to be able to contribute for sure is from that comms perspective and the use of that app. I, I I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember the name of the app. Do you remember it? Isn't it? It just is. It is it any more complex than just BC's COVID? BC COVID. It's, is it called yeah. BC? 
<laughs> okay, so I'll have to put it in the show notes or something later. But are we still, are we demonstrating how we Google, right? We would just put, put in BC COVID into Google and up would yeah. jump the app. Yeah. I would I would yeah. type in like yeah, BC Ministry COVID nineteen app or something like that. Yeah. But well, and I've got it on it's on my phone now, so I would just find it. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I if those of those of the listeners out there who haven't tried it please have it. And then if you develop symptoms or even if you haven't, take a look at the app. There's a lot of good information there. You'll be connected to trusted information that's based on the best evidence we have today. So from my understanding from the front end, what we were told was that the app is really meant to be a tool for communication between the government, the public, and the media as well. So it's uh, just a really a, me- a place to really consolidate information. Um, and it is, it's very usable. Um, it does have a self-assessment component to it and then gives you some basic instructions as to do what you would do based on those results. So a, a really useful tool for sure. Yeah, so it, it, in that uh, assessment side, it, it, would, it does have a decision tree about whether you, under the current guidelines or at the guidelines of the time, uh, required to be tested or not, right? I'm trying to remember the specific um, wording in terms of next steps mm. because yeah then I think that becomes an interesting question in terms of so so let me ask you this then so say I did that self-assessment tool and it was recommending that I move forward um, and my next question was about contacting my family doctor I haven't done this yet I haven't communicated with my family doctor since we this pandemic has hit mm. so how would that look different so if, if I was a patient mm. in your clinic um, yeah. how, how would it look dif- what would look different when I call your office now? Well, my phone lines might be busier than usual, that's number one. Uh, but let's say you get through to my staff, and my staff would actually offer you, if, if you said that you needed testing, we would refer you to, to one of our local testing sites. And I think every jurisdiction okay. now has, as I said, a set a testing site and what makes that testing site unique is that they have trained people trained in proper uh, personal protection equipment as well as in, which is needed during the swabbing procedure because the swabbing procedure is potentially a viral aerosolizing procedure so because it could make you sneeze for example and things like that and you're in, right. you have to be in close contact to put uh, something deep into your nasopharynx deep into your nose like all the way all the way into the back of your throat through your nose so uh, you, need, you need to have the right equipment and public uh, or family doctors do not normally store that volume of equipment and therefore we would refer you out for that. Um, if, it, if you just needed to chat with a physician, we would uh, book an appointment for you and give you a, uh, and connect with you via email or text and send you a link for the video teleconferencing system that we're using. Okay. And you, but you said it's under 50% of doctors are using that? I would guess so. That's my okay. assessment because there's some people who are just, some family doctors who are just, hey, you know, I don't know how to use um, the, the apps, so I'm just going to use the telephone. So the rest of them okay. are using the telephone and they're calling, calling patients. And what's great is that by last week, like with, I think by, yeah, by the third week of March, um, our government had, and in, in uh, partnership with the doctors of BC, revamped our medical services plan, MSP billing um, codes to allow us to actually bill for telephone work, to allow, to accommodate for the pandemic and to accommodate for physical distancing. And I thought that that was great. It's a great adaptation. Mm-hmm. And I know the United States did the same thing so that we can continue to be connected with our patients by telephone uh, in the lowest barrier way possible. And I know you've expressed great joy in, in this uh, lowering of barriers for healthcare access. And, and I, I'm totally there with you. I, I'm excited about this change and I hope we don't go back. I was gonna say, let's keep that. Yeah, so much <laughs> yeah. more efficient, so yep. much more. Um, yeah, and I mean, I'm not sure if any other provinces have done it, but the prescription shift has been really interesting too. Um, I think about that for prescriptions in this house. I know one of them has run out. And from what I understand, we won't have to, to even call in. We can just go to the pharmacy and the pharmacist can act on that. Mm-hmm. So, I used to hear like, a, like 5% of my colleagues used to complain and say, oh, I hate it when the pharmacist just refills on their own. It's like, like because 
when they refill, it's still under my name and I'm bearing the medical legal risk of it. And now the pharmacist is giving them that medication without assessing the patient. And, but now they're like, please, please pharmacist, just do it for me. I'm, I'm swamped. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. it's weird. The complete shifting of perspectives and, and, and priorities. Like what's really important, I think is kind of coming to the surface right now. Um, yeah, Ex except in that context that we talked about earlier with the no visitors thing. Yeah. So, so to go from, so there, there, there are specific assessment sites and then based on the results of your test, which could take, I'm hearing interesting things in terms of turnarounds. What are they like in BC for test results once you're assessed? <laughs> So it ranges anywhere. I've experienced the fastest I've experienced for an inpatient, for a patient who's admitted with suspected COVID symptoms, the fastest I've personally experienced, 70, uh, 48 hours, two days. Okay. That's the fastest. For outpatient tests, the fastest I've experienced was five days. So, but that could change. That, it changes depending on our backlog yeah. and, uh, and the, the number of, PCR machines we have out there, the polymerase chain reaction machines and the number of reagents that we have for those tests and the number of techs we have and the number of yeah. sites we have processing it. Uh, all the major hospitals in British Columbia are processing them themselves and are able to do about 150 each or so or more. And then the BC Center of Disease Control is doing a couple thousand, two or 3,000 of them every day. So wow. I think we have a testing capacity of approximately 8,000 tests a day right now. And we were backlogged for a while as we got up all the procedures running, you know, because every time you do a test, you have to do quality assurance on a test to ensure that your positive test is really positive or like, as much as you can, at least. Yeah. And from what I'm read that, that people can get multiple negatives and then get a positive too, right? So it sounds like the nature of testing this particular virus is, is pretty complex and, and frustrating and has a lot of questions around it. Um, but then I'm sure there's also a lot of people who, who are coming in and concerned to be tested because anxiety, their anxiety is high as well, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, before this pandemic, we had so many patients who would come to us on a regular basis with no symptoms except anxiety. And they would be, like, they would be asking for things like x-rays and blood tests to check various organs in their body. And in the context of this pandemic, that's still there. It's still there in, in terms of... Yeah, just, just test me. So, because once I get the test, at least I can feel like I don't have to worry anymore. Uh, but in this case, a negative is not always a negative because yeah. maybe at the time that you were tested, you, the concentration, like there's a threshold of viral particles concentration where the test becomes positive. And if you're below that threshold, you're not going to test positive. Mm -hmm. And our best guess is, is that it's a 70% uh, average sensitivity rate, meaning, you know, every, uh, we'll miss about 30% of the, the positives on first, on the first pass. And, wow. you know, and that's, but that being said, that is the best we have. And for every diagnostic test we have, whether it's an x-ray, whether it's a regular blood test for anemia or whatever, we have thresholds for each of those tests. And so we're always working on the best evidence and the best procedure available. And this just happens to be our best COVID positive, COVID testing available. So nobody else that we know really has is doing any better than us. And I'm sure somebody is working on a better test as we speak, but. I'm sure, yeah, everything's live, everything's active. So mm -hmm. the results from those tests always go back to the family practitioner? Yes. If you have uh, one? Okay. Yeah. And then, so that would involve like a follow-up phone call or, or telehealth video visit yeah. to give people direction. Yes, especially in this time, any positive result would be followed up aggressively uh, because we need to tell you so you'll know to be extra stringent with your self-isolation, your quarantining. And I've even heard of our med medical microbiologist, so a physician calling patients uh, personally in the community once they've tested positive. Uh, it'll be rarely, rarely will it be your family doctor at this point in time in end of March 2020 calling you for a positive. It'll, it'll, it'll more likely be a medical microbiologist or a public health officer. Yeah. Okay. For the negatives, 
that'll be your family doctor calling you probably. But for the positives, it'll be someone okay, who's more connected to a, a systems uh, linkage. So you are calling for the negatives because I know there's that sort of default. If you don't hear from us, yeah. you're, you're well, all yeah, good. Good news. <laughs> But in this heightened anxiety, I have been calling for negatives uh, for this particular test. The other ones, I'm, I'm putting those in the back burner. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing to hear. Yeah, okay. Processes are so interesting, eh? And so, yeah, I mean, the reassurances for the public, um, the efficiencies for you as a practitioner. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, people's level of anxiety, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're, everything we're, everything is being looked at from a different perspective at the, during this time and so change is yeah. the change is a constant right now yeah and, mm. so one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about and I've mentioned this to you is the sort of the battlefield analogy and mm -hmm. and how that shifts our thinking and our actions and I know I've thought about that as an advocate and that okay well I, you know have I made that shift in that regard in that um, practicing medicine, um, you know, in a war on a battlefield it must involve a completely different set of rules. That's not, not, some, not something I can comment on, right? Um, for a variety of reasons. But for me as an advocate, I think about, okay, well, what does that mean? Um, where, and you know, the larger question of where's the space for a patient advocate to contribute if we're talking about something like, you know, battlefield medicine, if I could use that phrase, how does that phrase sit with you? Do you feel like that's where you are or do you feel like you're waiting for that or? No, we, our medical leadership team has really been talking like that. We are, we're developing briefings where uh, recently I tapped into the Department of Defense's documents on the COVID-19 approach. That's the U.S. Department of Defense and shared with shared it with the medical leadership. They had diagrams of how to, how to create a uh, cohort, um, various patients who are ill and how to design, uh, you know, teams to take care of the infected and then other uh, shift scheduling to take care of the non-infected so that we don't cross infect. Um, so yeah, this is, this is absolutely a sense of uh, crisis management, emergency management, disaster management, uh, preparedness, um, emergency preparedness, it does feel uh, like we're approaching that type of situation. And, you know, they, yeah, we, it does feel like that. Uh, we haven't had, thank goodness, the, the number of casualties that uh, some other jurisdictions around the world have experienced, but we're nervous. We're still holding on for it. We're getting ready for the onslaught uh, at this time still. Yeah, and I'm sure that's what it has felt like in Italy, and I'm sure that's what it's starting to feel like if it doesn't already in the United States. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, uh, and as you said, a whole different type of thinking happens on the battlefield compared to a regular day at work. And we are shifting to those types of priorities now. A lot of, a lot of other things are being less focused on, we're, and we're tunnel visioning on a, on a certain number of things. And I think that's, we, with our limited resources, that's what we have to do. We have yeah. to focus sometimes on those things. But that's where bringing every person on the team's perspective, including patient advocates, is so important. Because with tunnel visioning necessarily, your sometimes your innovative abilities, your ability to think laterally, and so we need all the ideas we can. So someone on every on every team, you must have someone who's looking around. What are the other people doing? What are some other ideas? What are, what's something off the wall that, that we can try in these particular situations? And we're seeing evidence of innovation all around. And Doctors of British Columbia set up a specific site to share clinical innovations. Um, I think they're calling it Bang the Table. Doctors of BC Bang the Table, if you, if you Google that. Interesting, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's accessible to public, but uh, physicians around the province are sharing innovations. So things like the, the aerosol box for uh, when we're intubating, uh, those types I of protected things and um, shift how to design what what's called dirty team scheduling, um, which is a weird name, but yeah, those types of innovations are. Uh, yeah, COVID ops. Remember, that's my contribution to that's that. That's right. <laughs> that, that, sounded best. that sounds a lot better. COVID ops teams. Yeah. 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 
And what about from province to province or just even what, what to, to what degree do you find that you are in regular communication? You were talking about Slack and WhatsApp and different forms within, you know, within, it would be, I would assume within Fraser Health, but so how, how much of that communication moves outward to the province, to other provinces outside of Canadian borders? So we're, we're trusting our, you know, our, our provincial leadership team to go interprovincial. Um, and then, yeah, I'm, I'm in the, I'm within the silo of whatever's in British Columbia. And then I'm connected through social media to some of my colleagues from the States because I used to practice there, but that's it. So I don't, I don't, haven't been looking very much at other provinces. I've been very BC centric uh, within the exploration of COVID-19 yeah. uh, systems change approach. It's one of my concerns as, as from an advocacy standpoint in terms of particularly in thinking of being in a heightened state, right? And in sort of a reactionary mode and looking around for information and seeing duplication of tools, but maybe not consistency of information or even the structure, right? Like to, to think about, and then of course I start to think about the duplication of effort, right? How many people from province to province are expending energy to create all of these different tools? Are they all in communication with one another? Is there, are there you know, I work federally in my other life. And in that context, we talk about a common look and feel environment, right? Is there a common look and feel to those tools so that if, um, someone was looking, you know, got a little bit panicky because they weren't finding something on the BC site or the BC in the BC app and they went to Alberta or Ontario, would they find the same information? Would it look the same? Um, I'm just thinking about that from sort of a reassurance from a mental health standpoint, right? Um, so that's one of the things that I'm really intrigued about and frustrated with, I would think too, when I look at certainly the feedback I gave to this app, that was one of the things, the app here in BC, it was one of the questions that I asked, are you in, in communication with other provinces? And it sounds like that's going on. So that's good to hear, but I think it's, it's a really critical point. Yeah, no, that, that is a really good point. And I don't know how many people are actually doing that. And I, I'd hope that there are people doing that. And there definitely probably are, and I'm just not privy to the identity of who those people are. Um, yeah. yeah, that would suck to like find out that Ontario is doing something a lot better than us or completely different. That would, that would make me feel pretty bad. So, um, you know, thanks to the, to social media and the internet and different news reporting sites who are really on top of this, I, I think we're getting a lot of ideas from international communities, from China, uh, from Wuhan uh, physicians, yeah. from South Korea physicians and Italy, Italian physicians. Uh, yeah, amazing. which is so amazing, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that we have the capability to do that in twenty in twenty twenty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was I was so impressed with how China was able to source health professionals from like twenty nine other provinces and send them into Wuhan, and and the people actually volunteered to like I'm going to go there, I'm going to save the day, and it's amazing. And I just watched a parade yesterday for those healthcare workers going back to their home provinces from, from Hubei province. And there's, they were doing parades for them. People were like bowing to them in the streets and stuff. It was kind of cool, but amazing. Uh, it's amazing that they flew in to a danger zone to help out people they didn't know. And then they were doing celebrations. They're like, I am now Wuhan. Like I am Wuhan. It was so cool because they're from other places. Like imagine yeah. someone from Ontario, flying over to BC just to help out. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know if we would do that, I, it, but it was really impressive that that kind of stuff would happen there. Yeah. And then I saw yesterday that there was jumbo jets flying sick patients out of Italy to hospitals in Germany because Italy ran out of room and ran out of health professionals. So Germany yeah. is helping out Italian citizens. And, you know, it's just amazing that what they're able to do, I'm sure they're, they're probably not the COVID 19 positive patients that would be super risky <laughs> they're about yeah. all the covid negative ones who are still sick and need need good care but they were yeah. air air ambulanced in a jumbo jet ambulance all, all the way to germany and like the so countries are helping each other out these are these are really inspiring stories of altruism and and of humanity coming together and yeah i think those types of acts of compassion and generosity and charity are are lifting me up in these challenging times. 
for sure. I could be wrong, but I thought I saw a report or video footage of doctors from China coming to Italy already, which is a, again Maybe. also uh -huh. incredible, right? Given what has mm -hmm. gone on there, to to be able to immediately shift and mm -hmm. and bring their knowledge with them, right, and to contribute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I think I saw a report that about thirty five percent of Italy's health professionals uh, got got COVID-19 and many of the few of them quite a few of them perish but uh, some yeah. of them are still in recovery and so their workforce is so low they they have empty hospital rooms that can't be staffed and they have patients and yeah I, tough really tough situation yeah yeah which kind of goes back to the which goes back to that um, not a visitor concept and I know one of the things that came out this morning that I didn't have a time to have time to look at is some guidelines for caregivers um, to be able to support them in caring for their loved ones at home um, who may test positive but may not be sick enough to need to go into the hospital. So, um, you know, there's another really good tool that has been very rapidly developed. So I hope to be able to spend a bit, of bit more time with that, but I would think that that's a really critical thing as well, right? Even just to reassure caregivers in terms of what knowledge they need to be able to have to assess their loved one, um, which, you know, may reduce the impact on the system um yeah that's a great point i have i have not put much thought into that um i i've been advised people have been calling me and saying my mom is finding it hard to breathe now and then i just say bring her to the emergency room but that's because right now that's our emergency room has capacity yeah so yeah but, yeah well but, it's something to flag for sure and i don't think i think that's where that that sort of core caregiver community um, expands itself in that, um, you know, consciously, if you may not have a loved one that you do care for in a health capacity normally, but if they do come down with COVID and they're sick, you do become their caregiver, right? So, you know, those guidelines would apply whether you're already caring for someone or if it's just specifically in the context of COVID. And I think that could really take a lot of pressure off the system. So. I'll yeah, send you the link for that if you want to share that I'd around. I'd love to. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. You you had mentioned something on a chat uh, recently about talking to patients about potentially going into a hospital alone and what kind of guidance we can give someone or what can we say or give to someone who's going into a hospital knowing that nobody can visit them during this time. Yeah. Do you have any more thoughts on that? <sighs> Well, I think there's a larger conversation in there that has to do with how death, death, adver, death averse, it's always a hard thing to say, not just because of the, the meaning of the words, but um, how death averse our culture is, right? So um, I know that Brian Goldman, who's an emergency doctor and is, hosts White Coat Black Art on CBC, has been very overt on social media, on Twitter, um, about the fact that if he were to come down with COVID and needed to be um, intubated, that he would decline that. Um, and he's saying that part of the reason he's talking about that is that he wants us to have these public conversations and these personal conversations in our families with our loved ones about death. And I think that what loops in there is, is part of the, um, you know, you're go you may have to go in alone. You may not be able to have a loved one come along with you to support you or even to come visit you. And I, I think all of those conversations are one big loop in terms of, of thinking about um, what it means um, physically, emotionally, psychologically, um, to manage this disease within your own body, uh, what it means and that you might have to deal with it in isolation, in hospital, and what it means that you might die of it. And to have those conversations with ourselves, um, to have those conversations with our loved ones in terms of what we want for our care, um, all of those advanced care planning concepts that many of us who are under a certain age don't characteristically have and should, but, you know, that's a little finger wagging on my part, but, um, you know, that has definitely come to the forefront. So I think part of that is what my question was, is wondering, how do you prepare for that if you can at all, other than sort of raising the consciousness beforehand, right? It's one thing to say to someone who's tested positive and is having real dif difficulty breathing and I'm dropping them off at the hospital. It's one thing to have that conversation in that moment and it's another to have those conversations in advance. And, you know, knock on wood, perhaps if you have those conversations in advance, you'll be lucky and you'll never have to actually engage them. But I, I know in this house, it's myself and my 14 year old daughter, and 
we've talked a lot about preparatory things. I've shown her how to use the washing machine and some people might be listening saying, why doesn't your 14 year old know how to use the washing machine? <laughs> My daughter has a autism, re recent autism diagnosis, which she has given me permission to discuss. And so we have a very particular context in this house. So on a certain level, I am her caregiver, even though she ha does have a lot of dependents. Um, we have obsessive compulsive tendencies and diagnoses in this house as well. And so we make related supportive decisions in terms of our mental health um, that involve my doing the washing. And so I have spoken with her and showed her how to handle that. And we've had conversations about what if I were sick, but not sick enough that I needed to go to hospital, what would she do? Um, what if she was sick? Um, what are some what are some of the things that we've set aside in the home that I've purchased that she could eat? You know, we, we've talked about the what ifs and that's if we're still doing okay, right? But what I what I wonder about is and we're we're two really strong individuals, I'll give us that. I'll toot our horn a little bit, which I think is because of some of the things that we've had to process in recent years and over time about both of our own mental health and some of the things that we've gone through. We've gone through a death in our home. In the last couple of years as well right so it has brought certain emotions and conversations and honesty um, to the surface but we're also strong individuals who are both willing to look at those things so does that make it a little bit easier it's just this is just who we are it's not a comparison point to others but as a result it has made me think about okay well what kind of conversations would you have to prepare somebody um, before they actually got to that point where their breathing was difficult and were being dropped off by their husband or wife or son or daughter at the hospital. I've seen tweets about, I wish I would have said, my, you know, my father has now died of COVID. I wish I would have said the following to him when I dropped him off at the hospital. And I think, oh gosh, if, how, can we, how can we set things up so we don't say I wish? <laughs> so we really say the things that we need to say when we need to say them. And I mean, I've even gone so far as to, I had a dialogue, I threw it out to my death community, my grief community on Twitter and said, what are the things, what are the things we wanna elevate that we know because of what we've talked about in the context of death and grief? And one of the statements that I threw into the little discussion we had was that your loved ones know that you love them, that your loved ones know that. And you know, what, what are those statements, those I wish or those regret kind of statements that we can counteract with thoughts like that. Your loved ones know that, you know? So I think about, you can hear what I'm thinking about in that context, but yeah, how do we prepare people for that? Some people may not be able to prepare for that, may just not have it in them based on the ha how, how they handle themselves as individuals, other people's per perhaps more so. That is such an important, uh, that is such, that is such a great service. If if, uh, if you could get that information out there, or, or if we can get that information out there to have those types of, those talks before you can't have them. And that would provide so much, so much more peace for everybody, including uh, health professionals. When, yeah. when we don't know what the patient actually wanted, that is, that is a huge, huge challenge to, because we're just guessing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and I know those things fall to healthcare professionals as well sometimes, right? They would normally, but if you're dealing with a patient who doesn't have anybody at hand with them, any loved one or friend or whatever it might be, then I'm sure the pressure upon you when you're in a war, you're in a, on the battlefield to begin with, there's another added layer, right? So, and I don't know, I, you know, we're, we're preparing and reacting to so many things in society right now. Are we going to, are we going to have space to add those things in as well? I don't know. But I think for those of us who are in the quote unquote grief or death communities in terms of loud voices or active voices, I think we have a role to play to bring those things forward. Even just, you know, my thought was we see these really, um, clearly articulated infographics about um, basic information about COVID or basic steps that you take or how to wash your hands. It would be great to have a, an infographic with four or five really overt statements. And as you said, you could have that in hospital with you, right? Um, those could be up on walls in, in hospitals um, for patients to be able to clearly see that said things like that. I'm trying to remember some of the other statements I included in there, but I think for me, that's one of the strongest ones. Your loved ones know that you love them. That's amazing. Yeah. That is so true. That is so true. And yeah, 
we are we are expecting more death you know that's um, that's the unfortunate situation and this is the opportune time to get it out get out there earlier rather than later let's spread the awareness you know and mm -hmm. and we each have our own unique reactions and feelings about death right some of us will do absolutely everything we can um, and will battle through treatments and pain and other people um, that's not I mean you know I'm the wife of someone who chose chose an assisted death and people had opinions about you know that he could have gone through more chemo or or stayed alive longer or um, you know and he made the choice that was right for him so I think we each come at, at that with very different perspectives mm -hmm. for sure yeah but well, something to flag. You've made me, th in talking about this, I think I want to elevate that a little bit more and, and do some work on that. Yeah, I think that would be a huge service and I'll try to do do the same. I'll look for some other resources. I don't know if I can find an infographic, but I'll find some type, some type of graphic and post well, it. Well, yeah. Let me see if I can give you some, at least some wording or maybe that's something we can work together on to produce something like that. You know, people who are good at infographics, I don't. Um, I don't yeah, so maybe we can find someone to do something like for that. And that, that would be an interesting test, a test in the battlefield um, to give you something like that, that if the hospital approved could be circulated and, and, mm -hmm. and provided. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you, Yana. Was there anything else that you, any messages you wanted to leave uh, with us today? Oh, I'm sure there's a lot more we could talk about, right? But um, we probably both could use a little rest. <laughs> yeah. The brain's a little so, brighter. We've, we've talked a lot about, about a lot of things. There's nothing else left in my head, I don't think. Okay. Well, thank you so much for everything you're doing. Thanks for the continuous support and the love over social media. And um, stay well. Keep it up. You too, Lawrence. Thanks to you. <laughs> Thanks for your friendship. Yeah, you too. Bye. Take care.